Thank you very much uh, to Trezzy for uh, inviting me to uh, moderate this uh, uh, panel session entitled Does Mifid Give the uh, Right Answers? Um, and we have uh, uh, an appropriately um, informed and uh, knowledgeable uh, panel to uh, take a look at uh, that, um, that question within the context of the um, overall theme of the uh, of the uh, convention this year about uh, about um, the uh, the role of markets um, and the role of exchanges in the uh, wider economy. Um, there are some very uh, obvious uh, issues, I guess, that um, that uh, the uh, review of Mifid has uh, thrown up that have been touched on already this morning, um, relating to the um, the organised trade um, trading facility. Uh, uh, new category of uh, market venues, the um, the attempt to uh, define HFT, um, and uh, the uh, step forward towards uh, consolidated tape. All of these, I'm sure, will uh, um, will arise. Just um, to give you a, a little bit of background on um, uh, my own uh, perspective, the trade um, is a publication that's really aimed at the uh, institutional investor, the kind of trading desks, and the uh, execution focused portfolio managers amongst uh, um, international money managers. Um, and so that means that we take, uh, we've take uh, we focused um, very heavily on market structure and the extent to which uh, market structure enables uh, asset managers to, uh, to invest in a, in a, in a cost-effective way. Um, before we get into um, looking at uh, uh, MIFID II, uh, the, the MIFID review in, um, in a great amount of detail, I wanted to ask um, uh, Maria Teresa to um, actually help us, or kind of um, help us remember the, pr the road from MIFID to the current uh, MIFID review process, because, of course, this, um, this review exercise was in inherent in the original legislation, but the, um, the kind of financial turmoil, the, the, the credit crisis, call it what you will, um, from 2008 onwards, really kind of gave an added uh, element to the Mifid review. Um, Commissioner Barnier explicitly uh, made uh, the Mifid review uh, part of the uh, Commission's response to the crisis. So, um, Maria Theresa, if you could kind of explain from the Commission's perspective how the um, how, how the process has um, uh, taken place from you know Mifid one to the review. Thank you, Chris. Uh, good morning. Um, yes, as you very well said, the, the review process was inherent already in the MIFID I. However, there were developments in the markets and technological developments that have made this uh, review even more ambitious and important that, uh, it, than it was foreseen in the MIFID I. Um, the original objective of the MIFID um, were different objectives were to, to improve the resilience of the EU financial markets uh, through free competition and high levels of market transparency and investor protection. These are still the high key level objectives that uh, we have in this MIFID II review. But we have in this year, since 2004 until now, seen that uh, those objectives are not uh, fulfill in the way that the MIFID I had envisaged. This is the reason why in October, taking into account market developments, the crisis, uh, the, the developments also in the investors' behaviors and uh, technological developments have, have led us to uh, propose in October the MIFID review. And there are um, five, uh, six key areas where uh, we have uh, improve with our proposal. We, we are trying to improve this uh, uh, legal framework in order to make it more robust and to strengthen it, to establish this uh, safer, sounder, more transparent, and more responsible financial systems. The first one relates to uh, the need to have more robust and efficient market structures. And this is in terms of trading structures, but also in terms of post-trading structure. And that's why uh, for us it's very important to introduce uh, the, the free competition also in the field of uh, post-trading. Second key issue is taking into account the technological innovations. Here we are talking mainly about high-frequency trading, which is one of the issues that will be dealt in a specific panel. 
Third, increased transparency. Increased transparency uh, in equities and in non-equities also, pre-trade, post-trade, increase in the quality, the, the quality of the data that exists, and therefore introduction of uh, consolidated tape rules. Then uh, the fourth uh, element is to uh, introduce stronger investor protection because the crisis also has shown that uh, there are some areas where uh, additional protections to the investors, including professional invest investors, has to have to be added. And uh, for instance here, also one of the key elements is all the corporate governance requirements that we are introducing. And then the fourth area is reinforcing supervisory powers, uh, broadening also uh, the scope to, uh, for instance, emission allowances and the introduction of the, of the third country regime. So these are the key areas where we have seen that the MIFID I was not uh, uh, sufficient in order to fulfill the original objectives that I mentioned at the start. Thank you. Thanks very much. Um, well, based on that uh, uh, summary of the areas that uh, the Commission um, the, the Commission kind of focused on in, in its uh, review of MIFID and its uh, present uh, legislative uh, proposals. Um, perhaps it's appropriate, uh, Kay, for you to uh, uh, provide um, kind of your uh, perspective and uh, comments on the extent to which you feel that um, the, the uh, Commission has uh, um, kind of succeeded in its, uh, in, in its intentions and the extent to which you feel that um, refinement is uh, is required through the uh, legislative process. I actually have the, the privilege in some ways of uh, learning the lessons from the Commission. So they put their text out there first and then we get the opportunity to amend and, and to put forward uh, a significant number of ideas. And I'd say we, we're in the, the privileged position because of course the Commission's text brings forward a large response from the participants in the market. So we have the benefit of, of that response before we actually write our amendments. So I think we're in a, a slightly uh, better position than, than maybe uh, poor Maria, Ter Maria Teresa, who has to put it out there, and, and then we get the, the benefit. But the Parliament has actually put down 2,142 amendments, which sounds a huge amount of amendments. But actually, given the breadth and depth of this package, I'm not sure it is actually that many. And if you look at where those amendments are, they're in very specific areas and, and they're generated uh, very large numbers in very specific areas. And the thing that has surprised me in this process, we put down the amendments a very short time ago and we are likely, as it stands at the moment, I, I don't want to jinx anything, but it is likely that we will actually have compromises through the, the committee by the 10th of July for voting in committee. Now that is an incredibly tight timetable for something that has over 2,000 amendments. And comparing that, for example, to the AFMD, which went on well over a year in terms of getting compromises agreed, this is going to be a very quick process, mainly because there is consensus across the political groups on the big, big issues. And so I think that is testament to the work that the Commission have done beforehand in giving us a very good document to work from. And I think Judith mentioned, you know, some 90% of it, I'd say it's probably even higher, um, that, it, that there is broad agreement on. And yes, it's, it's helpful that we started the process at least two years ago. The discussion and debates have, have been going on for a long period of time. But there is a lot of consensus. And so, you know, I'm going to focus on, on three, three short, uh, uh, or three three-letter um, acronyms here that, that is going to take up a significant amount of time, and that's the OTF, the HFT, and OTC. Those three areas are the areas that we will spend the most amount of time debating as to whether or not an OTF is necessary as a category, whether HFT is really um, a, a, a devil in all of this and, and needs to, to actually be regulated out of the market, and whether or not we need a, a definition of OTC and if we do need one, who on earth is going to supply it because I'm certainly not going to be able to do it. So uh, there's going to be someone else who's going to have to step up to, to come out with one. I've decided I can't do it and, and all my attempts have failed. So those three areas are taking a disproportionate amount of time in terms of the discussions. Um, I can tell you, and, and there, are, there are no secrets, uh, our process in Parliament is fairly transparent. We had a, a compromise discussion this week, and it's fairly clear 
that there is only one political group who does not believe that the OTF category shouldn't exist. So there, all the others actually have concurred that actually the OTF um, facility is necessary. Um, it's now a question of what is necessary for in terms of what asset classes should be allowed to use an OTF. So there, there is a general broad consensus on that. HFT, there isn't as much of a consensus on. Um, there is a suggestion that there are measures that will go into the market that will need to moderate some of the behavior and some of the strategies. It's a question of what and whether that's actually a, an enforced latency or whether it's a tick size or a combination of the two, we're still in the process of having those discussions and that's not quite so easy to actually see where the consensus is gonna come from. And certainly this definition of OTC, as I say, we have tried um, in my political group to come up with a definition and we've decided it's, it's actually fraught. Um, my suspicion is that the rapporteur is, is now struggling as we speak to try and come up with a definition because the socialist group has said they will only agree to all the rest of it if there is a definition of OTC. So I think you're probably in a better position than most to actually come forwards with what you would define as, as that category. So I would um, suggest that you all get your thinking caps on and maybe your lawyers to uh, come forward with some text for us. Sadly, those three areas are not where I would actually like to be spending my time um, dealing with and, and, and improving. I would prefer to be talking about the SME growth market category and how we make that work and don't have an empty category. That's where I want my focus. I want my focus to be on transparency, particularly in the non-equity markets. How can we actually develop those markets? How can we get them more in the public domain? How do we actually create new market opportunities to bring new investors into, particularly the fixed income markets? And um, for me, you know, there are some major opportunities here. And MIFID is an opportunity rather than a threat. And I think that's how I would like to see this dossier. The fact we're starting with such a good starting point, um, testament to the work that, that Maria Theresa's team have, have actually done, for me, is it means that we should now be able to focus on these positives and get things like the SME growth market that we're giving an opportunity there. And I think that ties in a lot with the panel before about you know, the, the role of the primary markets. And, and people in this room are critical to getting those working correctly. And I would like to see the transformation of the European capital markets from debt instruments to the equity markets. And I think you are in a position to assist us as parliamentarians to actually get that balance back. Um, I bet it's never been here in Europe, but to actually get more of an equity culture rather than actually a, an over-reliance as I see it on debt. So we've got a huge opportunity, but I think I am right in saying I'm the only parliamentarian in the European Parliament who is actually involved in all four markets dossiers. And that's EMIR, which I've spent a good chunk of my life trying to get uh, the legislation around, MIFID, MAD, and CSD. So I, I think the continuity, I hope, will be there, um, if only because I can recall every conversation we've had so far on EMIR, MIFID, and MAD, and, and I'm, I have the benefit of writing the Parliament's response to the CSD dossier as the rapporteur. So I, I hope you'll think that there is at least some continuity and that just because we don't do it in Dodd-Frank style as one big dossier, that there isn't at least some thought going to have a coherent market structure going forwards. Thanks very much, Kay. I'd, um, I'd hope that um, the uh, uh, OTF will, won't uh, take up a disproportionate amount of, uh, disproportional amount of uh, our time today, but uh, it is uh, probably uh, the, uh, one of the kind of ho hottest uh, topics relating to, um, to um, uh, MIFID II. Um, so I'd like to um, kind of invite uh, Michael um, to, uh, to start off with the... Uh, um, from the uh, exchange per perspective, Deutsche Börse's perspective, if um, the uh, OTF uh, uh, category, which uh, is interesting to hear Ar Arlene describe it as uh, just simply legalizing um, loopholes in existing legislation, but if the um, OTF is uh, to be al almost certainly part of the, um, of the kind of uh, regulatory framework for uh, trading venues um, in, in, in Europe, what, um, what role do you think um, it, uh, it should play? Thank you for that question, Chris. Yeah, I believe that, uh, of course, MIFID II for all of us is a great opportunity to close the loopholes that arose uh -huh. with the implementation of MIFID I. And of course, one aspect of that is um, that we want to create a level playing field amongst different trading venues and different trading styles. And of course, it's very important to treat same business with the same rules. 
so I believe um, closing loopholes is one aspect, but not creating new loopholes is another one. So from our perspective, um, OTFs um, might make sense for certain asset classes, but of course they should really be analyzed in, in more detail to really see what kind of um, design per asset class should be implemented for OTFs. Um, from our perspective, for equity markets, um, OTFs is not a category that makes sense, uh, bringing the markets forward, increasing transparency, because it might be the case that OTFs for equity markets would create new loopholes due to the discrimination of access and due to different styles of, of matching orders in that category. So we believe that for OTFs it does not make really, for equities it does not really make sense to implement OTFs. Bjorn, what would uh, your perspective be from uh, uh, NASDAQ OMX? But um, I, I tend to agree with, with uh, Deutsche Börse. Let me start by agreeing with Kay and, and Judith. I think 85, 90% of the MIFI 2 is good. Uh, but if I should start with some of the bad things, that is the OTF, especially on, uh, on equities. Um, I have a concern about we'll see some of the trading that we see on the regulated market or on GMTFs that some of that flow will move to the OTF category where we have less regulation and just looking at some of the wording as around the OTF category where you have to restrict access, you have uh, the discretion in, in the execution of orders. We talked about, we heard earlier about the confidence in the equity market. When I hear um, discretion in execution of orders, uh, restrict access, that is difficult to explain to retail in investors. Is that the, this type of confidence will try to build, build by creating a new category with less regulation and will, there will not be equal right for investors? That's my concern. Mm -hmm. uh, Maria Theresa, can I uh, ask you uh, um, to perhaps uh, pr provide uh, some of the context for the development of the uh, OTF category in, in terms of, because my understanding always was that uh, it, its uh, primary function was to uh, um, to uh, you know, create a uh, category of um, a venue that would serve the migration of uh, OTC derivatives onto uh, um, centrally cleared exchange-like uh, electronic platforms, and that the um, that its uh, role in the kind of uh, uh, equity markets was perhaps a secondary consideration. Is that a fair enough description or not? And actually, there are two key objectives at the same level, not secondary. One is the, precisely what you mentioned, due to the G20 commitment to, uh, for the mandatory uh, execution of uh, derivative trades in, in organized venues. Uh, we consider that uh, in parallel to what in the US they are doing by the creation of the SEF, it was necessary also in the EU to uh, regulate other platforms, multilateral platforms, in addition to regulated markets and MTFs, in order to, to allow for these trades on derivatives taking place there. And the second key objective was uh, the fact too that um, uh, due to the definitions we have of regulated market and MTFs, uh, which um, are systems where um, trades have to be uh, executed without any type of discretion, uh, the MIFID framework allowed for the creation outside the, the legal framework and legally done, uh, because it's due to the definitions we have, allowed the development of platforms where this discretionary execution uh, was used due to the fact that uh, the investment firms have the obligation to provide this execution. And therefore our intention is to regulate these today dark pools, uh, and these are the, the BCNs, uh, to, to bring regulation to them and um, uh, regulate in the same manner, same type of activities. Um, we, in our proposals, our intention is not to have a second quality, second type of uh, platform there with less uh, regulation. No, our intention is to introduce the same level of regulation in terms of organizational requirements, in terms of surveillance requirements, in terms of access, because access also is non uh, discriminatory in the OTFs. Uh, the OTFs, they will have to set objectively which type of uh, members, let's say clients, they accept in the same way that the MTFs and regulated markets they do. So they will have to set these specific uh, requirements. The only difference for us is the, uh, what I mentioned at the start, the 
the issue of uh, discretionary execution. But this discretionary execution is limited by the best execution obligations towards the clients that the, the operators of the OTFs have. Therefore, from our side, in our proposal, we uh, have introduced a strong uh, regime. Also, taking into account the fact that uh, these OTFs have to be neutral and multilateral, and therefore we have introduced this ban on, on proprietary capital, which is also quite controversial, I think, also in the parliament. Thank you. Indeed, thank you very much. Um, Okay, without um, uh, preempting too much the, um, uh, the discussions and negotiations that are going to take take place, what, 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 what is your sense that the um, the kind of role of, AT, uh, um, of the OTF is likely to play from a um, from a kind of equity markets perspective? I do have to say up front, there is no conclusion yet from the Parliament as to what asset classes will use the OTF. Mm -hmm. So there is an acknowledgement that they will exist. It's a question now of, of the, the, the political compromise uh, position. And, and there, it's across the spectrum. There are people who obviously didn't want it to exist in the first place who, if they are going to accept its existence because of the majority will it to happen, then they obviously want it to be as limited as possible. And that is likely to only be the fixed income space. <coughs> So it's, it's likely to be the, the bond markets and, and the derivative space that cannot go on to, to exchange. So that it's likely to be, yeah, the, there's a call for it to be as limited as possible. The question is going to be where the rapporteur himself comes down. Um, the parliament is, is one of those uh, places where you have often a left-right split here, and in this instance the rapporteur is sitting in the middle and he can go left or right. And, and left or right, left will limit it, right will broaden it. So it's, it's going to be entirely up to him to decide which way he's, he's going to go. Um, in, in my case, I would like the platform to have safeguards within it. So I would like this to have, for comparable business, it should be comparable regulation. So I, I agree you know, with, with the Commission's findings on this. It should not be a lesser platform. It, it should be subject for the same function, the same rules. Now, if they can move to the, the uh, regulated markets or to the MTFs, then they should do so. And, and I think the market will encourage it. But I want the market to actually decide to move in that direction. I don't want, as a legislator, to force things down a particular path. Um, for me, if we can move some of the non-equities trading from pure OTC right now to a public platform, I think we are already moving the market in the right direction. And I hope that that means that the markets see the opportunities and will put in place more um, ma liquid markets in the future will actually hopefully migrate onto other platforms. And I can see that happening in fixed income if we create the first step. Mm -hmm. run, it's almost kind of a, a mini big bang for fixed income by creating this OTF as a, a stepping stone to what I hope is going to be a major change in the way that the dealer markets of the future will actually be operating. So I don't see it all as a threat, as, as I said in the beginning. I see that this could be a stepping stone to a much more liquid market and, and maybe even a, a more um, interactive market going forwards um, so that people on the buy side can see what the market is delivering for them. I suspect when they start to have some transparency, they'll realize they want more. And, and I think and I hope that the buy side will start to push that, that for the future. Indeed, thank you, Kay. Um, obviously, one of the um, one of the substantial uh, differences that uh, the Mifid review is going to make is that uh, extension of the kind of Mifid principles to um, uh, further asset classes, um, fixed income um, derivatives, um, and that this may actually um, be the case that, uh, that it's these asset classes that see the biggest change through uh, uh, the Mifid review process. Um, Bjorn. Um, your uh, your exchange already um, has a uh, uh, a kind of um, central kind of fixed income uh, trading uh, platform. Um, so it'd be interesting to uh, hear, hear your perspective on how, how you expect uh, the Mifid re review to uh, change the um, change change the kind of trading environment um, for the uh, for uh, the uh, kind of uh, uh, bonds and other kind of. Uh, Fixed income uh, instruments and, and and that question of um, kind of providing uh, greater uh, um, transparency uh, in in those markets. 
Yeah, we have a, have a rather big uh, fixed income market, mainly in, in, um, in Copenhagen and also to some extent in, in Stockholm. Um, 90%, 99% of that market is traded OTC today. So I agree that there is, is room for m improvement. I think a lot of that improvement has to be done through the dealer community because we would be happy to move more of that into a more transparent market. But of course, that's something that we need to discuss with our customers, the dealers. Mm -hmm. uh, but of course, um, and that's also getting back to my point, the OTF, OTF category, I don't see a need for that for equities. I think and we also see some of the broker crossing networks like UBS, Numerous, their broker crossing network has actually moved into, into an, has become an MTF. So I don't think there's a need for that for OTF for equities, but for fixed income, I think that's that is an opportunity. I think it it makes sense to some extent. Let's see how the final outcome would be. But for fixed income market, I see, uh, I understand the argument, but it's difficult to see how much it will change at this point in time. One of the um, other issues that um, uh, relating to transparency of markets, which um, I'm, I'm sure we all agree is, uh, is an important part of, um, uh, of confidence in markets that we're all so keen to uh, see return, is the question of um, being able to un un simply understand where, um, uh, where trades are being conducted and the price at which they are being conducted. And that uh, brings on to the issue of uh, the consolidated tape which um, certainly my, uh, my, my readers, uh, whilst there may be, um, there have been kind of pr uh, proprietary solutions for some time, um, institutional investors continue to uh, be, be um, it, the consolidated tape probably uh, tends to be very much top of their list in terms of what they want to see uh, the, um, uh, the MIFID review achieve. Uh, the, uh, the issue of uh, fragmentation um, is a very, Live one, Hans Ole mentioned um, quite how many uh, venues you can buy uh, Vodafone on these days. Um, Leland, I'd like to um, ask, uh, ask you on your, your view of um, whether you see, you know, on, on your perspective on the consolidated tape, the need for a consolidated tape across uh, equity and uh, equity-like um, uh, instruments, and the extent to which you feel that uh, MIFID, uh, uh, the MIFID review is uh, ma making the right uh, uh, steps to uh, helping uh, investors understand um, um, uh, market data um, um, more, more clarity, more transparency than they can at the moment. Sure. So, so first, I'd like to thank Feze for um, including the the buy side perspective um, in in the event this year. Um, from BlackRock's perspective, I, I think increasing connectivity um, amongst uh, exchanges um, and other liquidity venues is of paramount importance um, to both investor confidence and investor experience. Um, BlackRock represents, um, we, ma we manage over 2 trillion euros on behalf of a variety of investors globally and, and in Europe. Um, and we feel that as markets are more connected, um, for re regardless of the, the, the acronym necessarily on the market, whether it's lit exchange, OTC, o OTF, MTF, um, it's the c interconnectivity and the guidelines um, between that connectivity um, to create a more robust, consolidated environment that bring investor confidence, confidence in both providing and consuming liquidity from that market. Um, in speaking with a number of our clients um, and investors, as well as liquidity providers and many um, of the venues in this room, uh, we think the markets are very much ready for that next step of sort of a consolidated pool of liquidity or, com or connected pool of liquidity. Um, we believe that lowers total cost of investing, which is a good thing for investors. Um, so very much I think that the consolidated tape um, is, is a good step forward. In addition to managing um, assets as a fiduciary on behalf of clients, we're also, I believe, one of the largest issuers of securities um, through our exchange traded fund business. Uh, we have over 1,400 lines of trading um, across Europe in our iShares products. Um, and for those products, we endeavor to partner with um, liquidity venues to build a more robust and interconnected pool of liquidity so that clients can interact with those products uh, more effectively. Um, we've made some efforts in, of, of late working with data providers to create a more consolidated view of liquidity. Um, but certainly we think as markets get more connected, both in the pre-trade and in the post-trade, um, that is a good thing. 
we, we are not naive. There, there are challenges to doing that, um, but we believe it is in the long-term best interest of creating a more robust European capital market. Thank you, Thank you Roland. Um, the, we, we, Bern raised the subject of the amount of uh, venues, the, uh, uh, the question of uh, um, con consolidating that, um, the uh, market data. Um, and clearly, fragmentation has been um, a significant uh, part of uh, the, um, the uh, MIFID story uh, to date, as it, as it were. Um, Michael, can I ask you how, how you feel the, uh, the issue of uh, fragmentation of liquidity across uh, multiple venues, how, how you feel that has affected um, the, uh, the end users of the uh, uh, financial markets, the investors, um, if you will, and, and, and how you feel that um, the MIFID review process um, will um, influence the, um, you know, the, the, nature, the issues that uh, fragmentation um, arises in, in the future. Yeah, I believe, um, of course, the good side of fragmentation is um, that you create competition amongst trading venues when you trade the same equity around different trading venues, which is a good thing. Um, I think there's also problems coming with it. Of course, you need to consolidate all the data from different trading venues to have the full picture. The full picture is there for regulated markets and MTFs. The big issue, of course, is OTC data, which is not available as of today, so it's not possible as of today, even for equities, to have that consolidated view that iShares is currently working on, so I think that's very important. Um, the other issue, of course, is that you need to be connected to all these different trading venues which actually comes probably at a cost of technology and services and combining and aligning data from, from different trading venues. The benefits, of course, are that you create competition amongst trading venues and probably prices decreased, as we've heard in the morning, by, by around 60%. Whether it's net-net a good thing for the market, I'm not sure, but I think we, we need to manage it. Competition is there. It's a good thing. We just need to see that we really combine the existing OTC trading volumes into lit markets, so therefore I fully agree with what the panelists said, that we need a definition of OTC trading. We really need to address the issue that around 70% of the orders that are executed in OTC markets could have been filled on lit markets without any negative market impact, so I believe that is a real potential to really increase transparency and market quality among uh, European trading menus. Mm -hmm. um, I guess regu regulation can only do um, so much to bring those um, to bring those uh, orders onto uh, onto exchange. Uh, Bjorn, what do you think um, uh, exchange groups should be uh, doing um, themselves to ensure that um, that they're making their markets as attractive as possible for these orders? Well, I, th I think we can do a lot. Uh, I still think uh, the whole discussion about confidence: uh, how to make sure that. Uh, investors feel much more confident when they trade, trade on, on our markets. But maybe may, let me get back to the discussion about the OTC. I think it's a, it's a big problem for, for the industry that we do not agree how big is the OTC volume, right? Is it 13%? Is it 14%? Um, uh, even, yeah, there's a lot of discussion around how big is the market. And I think it's a bit embarrassing that we do not know how much uh, trading there is in Nokia on a daily basis. We know that it's traded around 40, 30 venues, but we do not know how big the volume is because there's no clear definition on, on, OTF, o, on the OTC volume. And I think that's, that's a challenge. So I think one of the steps is to make sure that there's a standard for, for the OTC volume, at least. We need to make sure that we are better in measuring the, the OTC volumes. So we, at least as a starting point, can agree how big is the trading in the OTC space? Mm -hmm. uh, the, um, the, the Commission um, has, uh, in, in its draft of, uh, of, of MIT, the MIFID review as it stands, offers uh, a number of approaches to um, uh, creating the uh, consolidated tape, uh, Maria Theresa, in, in, in terms of um, this, my understanding is that there's currently kind of three uh, appro approaches um, that were outlined in um, the October draft. Um, th however, there is, you know, there has been a relatively kind of uh, 
slow progress, although obviously the exchanges have played rather a significant role in, uh, in uh, reforming elements of how they provide market data. Uh, are, are you, um, uh, you know, kind of fully confident that the, uh, the, the approach that's in the um, um, directive will, will aid uh, transparency in the, um, as, um, in an appropriately short time frame? Thank you. I think that uh, it's recognized by, by everybody that uh, there is an issue on the transparency and that there is an issue on the formats, on the quality of data, and the cost, the rela re uh, uh, sorry, reliability of this data, and something needs to be done. Therefore, in our proposal, uh, we have uh, introduced now this uh, mandatory consolidated tape for trade data, but we have given this to the market, let's say, the market will have to, using this framework, develop the system. And if it doesn't work, then we'll go through the review system to um, a single entity at European level. But what I would like to say is that, uh, and something that uh, even Kai has mentioned before about the uh, market structure that we see that even now when uh, we are in the council, uh, the parliament and the council, you are negotiating, we are all negotiating the proposals. There are changes already in the market taking into account what we are doing. I have to say that in the field of transparency of this improving the quality of data, uh, we have seen that since the moment we started talking about this review, and as everyone is recognizing that there is an issue, there have been initiative and phase uh, is, uh, uh, has brought uh, uh, a particular initiative in this respect that are very important in order to achieve this goal. But uh, as mentioned, our proposal includes this market solution, but uh, if it doesn't work, uh, then we'll, we, even in the proposal, we announce already a single consolidated tape. But of course, now everything is under the negotiation in the European Parliament and the Council, so we'll see what is the final outcome. But in principle, from the Commission side, <laughs> taking into account the specific quality standards, authorization systems for the different players, and so we consider that it can work the market solution. Michael, you wanted to come in? Yes, uh, if I may add, uh, I think we are on a good way as an industry, because under the umbrella of, of FESA, together with lots of industry participants from the regulated market side and also from the MTF side, also certain um, OTC trading venues participating, we are creating that market model typology which hopefully will lead us to a market-driven solution towards consolidation of post-trade data and creating a consolidated tape at um, low cost. So I think we are on a good way to accomplish that goal before regulation kicks in. Thank you, Michael. Okay, so we've, we've uh, touched on OTF um, and uh, OTC of, uh, three's, uh, of K's uh, three acronyms. We're gonna leave HTFT till s this afternoon. The other acronym that, um, Kay, you wanted to uh, make sure there was sufficient to focus on was uh, SMEs. Um, cl clearly, um, growth in the SME market um, is uh, an important driver in any, uh, uh, any part of the uh, economic cycle. Um, to what extent do you feel that, um, uh, that the appropriate uh, uh, regulatory structure can, uh, can make a, a big difference to um, uh, the growth of, uh, of SMEs? I think all we can do is try and put a framework around this. And, and for me, putting the SME growth market as a category here in MIFID and actually putting it into the MIFID text as this, this label allows a lot of flexibility in other pieces of legislation that we can now actually refer to it. There are currently seven definitions in European legislation as to what an SME is. And I don't want to actually pick one definition of an SME, I want an SME growth market defined so that we can actually have a label and a category so that member states can then use things like their taxation system to encourage investment in this category. I think it gives a framework for member states to use, it gives a framework for other pieces of legislation in the parliament in, in Europe to use, such as the transparency directive, the prospectus directive. If we can actually find a way of lessening the burden of bringing a company to market, then this has to be the first starting point of creating the, the category and the framework to allow that to happen. 
at the moment, you know, when we hear that 90% of, of certain markets are actually would be classed as an SME and a, a, a typical European definition, that isn't what we're trying to capture. This is the growth markets. This is trying to get those companies who are very quickly needing capital to actually take them from the small to the medium and through, hopefully, to the large companies of Europe's future. And, and we have to facilitate that. And it's only a starting point. The real issue here will be the cultural change, and we'll be getting to member states to actually say, if this category exists, what can you now do to encourage companies to go down that route? How can you make it more equitable for equities rather than debt in your tax treatment? They, they have a mechanism by which they can actually uh, define this and, and use it. So we can just create the, the structure. What we can't do is obviously fill it. Mm -hmm. We can now actually hopefully get member states engaged in it and actually get every part of the legislation making sure that they consider this particular asset class separately so that they can actually put a, a less burdensome framework for them when it comes out to uh, and, and changes to the prospectus in particular directive. Mm -hmm. I think it will make a big difference there. Mm. Um, I guess uh, exchanges have been um, uh, sometimes accused uh, uh, recently of perhaps focusing uh, on, uh, certainly by my um, uh, readers amongst the institutional investors, that uh, exchanges have focused on uh, perhaps uh, um, you know, facilitating uh, high frequency uh, uh, trading um, and uh, kind of competing on, on, on that kind of technology level um, more perhaps than on the uh, listings level, but uh, I guess the, that recent Eurotunnel uh, news might suggest uh, things are, 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 are turning a little. Bjorn, um, what would be your perspective on how um, exchanges can um, you know, facilitate uh, SME growth within uh, the, their own um, home markets? We can actually do a lot, and I think it's a fair point that we have probably not been good enough for the last couple of years to, to look at the small cap or uh, small cap segment. From a trading perspective, it's 1% of my revenue, rest if mid cap and large cap. So of course, I, I have a tendency to look more at the large cap companies. But what we have done in the Nordics, we have created a, a new market, a little bit like AIM, uh, called First North, where we have around 150 companies listed. Uh, so that's one way. Also on the regulation side, we could do more also for the normal, traditional regulated market. We have minimum requirements, but the soft law, the compli compliant and explain is also a way to try to differentiate between small cap, mid cap companies and large cap companies. So when you have the soft, soft law where you actually have the re possibility to not follow the rules, but explain. I think that's one way where you can ease the burden on the small cap, mid cap companies saying we do not follow this standard because the size of the company, that is the one way to explain. So the soft law, comply and explain is one way to try to help the small cap, mid cap companies to not have the same strict regulations as the large cap companies. That is one way combined with also a, a special market for very small companies, first laws like we have in, in the Nordic countries, a little bit like it. And from the um, uh, buy side perspective, uh, obviously uh, SMEs quite often um, are, are able to uh, uh, provide uh, your end investors with um, the kind of level of uh, returns that uh, aren't uh, uh, simply aren't possible from uh, more mature uh, um, companies. Uh, you know, how do you uh, view the, um, the the landscape for in investing effectively in uh, small to mid cap firms? Yeah, I, th I think, um, to Bjorn's point, that the, the challenge, right, is that um, the exposures and, and that investors are increasingly looking for, um, and in fact, the vehicles they're looking for, which democratize access to those exposures, um, are not currently um, as readily available on exchange or transparent markets. That doesn't mean investors don't desire those exposures in a more transparent, interconnected marketplace. In fact, they do. When you look at growth in exchange-traded funds, the asset growth is coming in things like high-yield bonds, um, investment-grade bonds, corporate issuers, as well as in the small-cap and mid-cap space. Um, and again, I think one of the benefits that if you look at the ETF landscape, it, it, we have these are now exchange-traded instruments um, that have those asset classes that Bjorn alluded to, which may not currently be a large percentage 
of exchange revenue, perhaps, but that is, makes them no less desirable um, from in the end user and in the end investor's perspective. So I think the challenge from, for, for, for this group um, and for us um, as well is to think about how do we continue to consider the end user and the investor in this process? Um, because as markets become more transparent, more connected, and liquidity grows, I think we will find consumption of those markets will grow as well. Um, and ultimately that will lead to greater confidence in this market, which, which I think we all have a vested interest in. Thank you. Um, can I, um, as we're getting close to um, the end of our uh, session, can I open up the uh, floor to uh, any, any questions from the audience at this point? There's one uh, gentleman at the back to the uh, right. Thank you. Um, could I ask uh, Leyland, um, you know, to look at um, or maybe give some thoughts about how the buy side intends to take more charge of their own orders in the future? Because a lot of what we're discussing as exchanges is, you know, at the end of a chain where we have intermediaries in between, and, and uh, you know, it seems sometimes that. Um, a direct link is maybe not possible between the buy side and exchanges for obvious reasons, but you know, it, it seems the buy side, especially in Europe where it's majority owned by the sell side, um, is not really taking charge of their own orders and say, you know, prevents a $1 million order splitting up 100 times. Um, yes, so I, we have had a number of conversations recently both in the, um, as at BlackRock and our peers, as well as um, within our iShares business um, and our peers on the issuer side. And I think you can expect that as a community, we are going to get more vocal in our expectations and desires um, on the market structure front, um, both in working with uh, broker dealer partners, as well as working with um, the liquidity venues and trading venues. Um, again, thinking about our, our role as a fiduciary and achieving the outcome that is best for those who have entrusted their asset management to us. Um, we have a responsibility to get more vocal in the changing landscape and, and, and you should expect us to do that. Any other uh, questions? Okay, so I'll just add uh, my perspective on that particular point, which is that I do see um, a certain amount more uh, uh, activity on, on, on the buy side in developing their own um, structures. One interesting thing that we followed on, uh, on, on the trade is uh, a uh, Helsinki-based asset manager, Pahola Asset Management, uh, developing its own smart auto routing um, capability um, because it simply wasn't happy with how its orders were being routed to market um, by, by broker-dealers. And, uh, and uh, they have actually opened up that smart order router to um, a wider range of uh, other asset managers, uh, including l large UK-based ones such as uh, Scottish Widows. So there is, there, there is an example there, I think, of uh, the buy side taking matters into their own hands in order to make sure that their, tra their uh, trades are uh, executed in the way that um, they would uh, want. But uh, I think we are now running out of time, so I'd like to uh, thank the uh, thank the panelists and uh, let Judith